conversation with Rahugana Maharaj. And so if you don't mind, we'll just get right into it tonight. No sense in dilly-dallying when you got the nectar waiting, right? <laughs> right. So I am going to start by offering my respects to the spiritual master. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhagade, Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane, Namaste Saraswati Devim Gauravani Pracharane, Nirvishesha Shunivari Paschat Yere Shatarane, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhunichananda, <coughs> Shri Advaita Gita Hari Shivasri Gauri Bhaktivedanta. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. Hang on one second. <coughs> Sometimes you just need a little agua. Okay, so we just had near Jala. That means no agua. So, all right, here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. When you know. All right, so this is uh, chapter nine, character of Jada Bharat, <clears throat> and I'll start out reading if I can. Maybe Rangavati, you could start out reading tonight. <laughs> Let me get my voice back. Do you mind? Okay, okay. And I think it's recording. First it time is. ever, I've got a pause and a stop recording buttons here. I've <clears throat> never had that before. Good. That's good. Go for it. All right, here we go. Turning over the right page. Okay. Chapter number nine, the supreme character of Jada Bharat. Srila Sukadev Goswami continued, My dear kin, after giving up the body of a deer, Bharat Maharaj took birth in a very pure Brahmana family. There was a Brahmana who belonged to the dynasty of Angira. He was fully qualified with Brahminical qualifications. He could control his mind and senses, and he had studied the Vedic literatures and other subsidiary literatures. He was expert in giving charity, and he was always satisfied, tolerant, very gentle, learned, and non-envious. He was self-realized and engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. He remained always in a trance. He had nine equally qualified sons by his first wife, and by his second wife he begot twins, a brother and a sister, of which the male child was said to be the topmost devotee and foremost of saintly kins, Bharat Maharaj. This, then, is the story of the birth he took after giving up the body of a deer. Due to his being especially gifted with the Lord's mercy, Bharat Maharaj could remember the incidents of his past life. Although he received the body of a Brahmana, he was still very much afraid of his relatives and friends who were not devotees. He was always very cautious and of such association because he feared that he would again fall down. Consequently, he manifested himself before the public eye as a madman, dull, blind, and deaf, so that others would not try to talk to him. In this way, he saved himself from bad association. Within, he was always thinking of the lotus feet of the Lord and chanting the Lord's glories which saved one from the bondage of fruit of action. In this way, he saved himself from the onslaught of non-devotee association. The Brahmana father's mind was always filled with affection for his son, Jada Bharat, Bharat Maharaj. Therefore, he was always attached to Jada Bharat. Because Jada Bharat was unfit to enter the Grahasta Ashram, he simply executed the purificatory process up to the end of the Brahmachari ashram. Although Jada Bharat was unwilling to accept his father's instructions, 
the Brahmana nonetheless instructed him in how to keep clean and how to wash, thinking that the son should be taught by the father. Jadabharat behaved before his father like a fool, despite his father's adequate instructing him in Vedic knowledge. His behavior in that way, he behaved in that way so that his father would know that he was unfit for instruction and would abandon the attempt to instruct him further. He would behave in a completely opposite way. Although instructed to wash his hands after evacuating, he would wash them before. Nonetheless, his father wanted to give him Vedic instructions during the spring and summer. He tried to teach him the Gayatri mantra, along with Omkara and Vaihurti. But after four months, his father still was not successful in instructing him. The Brahmana father of Jadabharat considered his son his heart and soul, and therefore he was very much attached to him. He thought it wise to educate his son properly, and being absorbed in this unnecessary and being absorbed in this unsuccessful endeavor, he tried to teach his son the rules and regulations of Brahmachari, including the execution of the Vedic vows, cleanliness, study of the Vedas, the regulative methods, service to the spiritual master, and the method of offering a fire sacrifice. He tried his best to teach his son in this way, but all his endeavors failed. In his heart, he hoped that his son would be a learned scholar, but all his attempts were unsuccessful. Like everyone, his Brahmana was attached to his home, and he had forgotten that someday he would die. Death, however, was not forgetful. At the proper time, death appeared and took him away. Thereafter, the Brahmana's younger wife, after entrusting her twin children, the boy and girl, to the elder wife, departed for Pataloka, voluntarily dying with her husband. As the father died, the nine stepbrothers of Jada Bharat, who considered Jada Bharat dull and brainless, abandoned the father's attempt to give Jada Bharat a complete education. The stepbrothers of Jada Bharat were learned in the three Vedas, the Rig Veda, Sama Veda and Yeda Veda, which very much encouraged fruitive activity. The nine brothers were not at all spiritually enlightened in devotional service to the Lord. Consequently, they could not understand the highly exalted position of Jada Bharat. Degraded men are actually no better than animals. The only difference is that animals have four legs and such men have only two. These two-legged animalistic men used to call Jada Bharat mad, dull, deaf and dumb. They mistreated him and Jada Bharat behaved for them like a madman who was deaf, blind or dull. He did not protect or try he did not protest or try to convince them that he was not so. If others wanted him to do something, he acted according to their desires. Whatever food he could acquire by begging or by wages, and whatever came of its own accord, be it small quantity, palatable, stale or tasteless, he would accept and eat. He never ate anything for sense gratification because he was already liberated from the bodily conception, which induces one to accept palatable or unpalatable food. He was full in the transcendental consciousness of devotional service, and therefore he was unaffected by the dualities arising from the bodily conception. Actually, his body was as strong as a bull's, and his limbs were very muscular. He didn't care for winter or summer, wind or rain, and he never covered his body at any time. He lay on the ground and never smeared oil on his body or took a bath. 
Because his body was dirty, his spiritual effulgence and knowledge were covered, just as the splendor of a valuable gel, gem is covered by dirt. He only wore a dirty loincloth and his sacred thread, which was blackish. Understanding that he was born in a Brahmana family, people would call him a Brahma Bandhu and other names. Being thus insulted and neglected by materialistic people, he wandered here and there. Should I pass that over? Yeah, let's let whoever? somebody else. Yeah, whoever wants. <clears throat> you know, I'm happy to jump in. Go right for it, yeah. Yeah, I missed you guys last week. That's right. Yes, Jada Bhatta used to work only for food. His stepbrothers took advantage of this and engaged him in agricultural field work in exchange for some food. But actually, he did not know how to work very well in the field. He did not know where to spread dirt or where to make the ground level or uneven. His brother used to give him broken rice, oil cakes, the chaff of rice, worm-eaten grains, burned grains that had stuck to the pot. But he gladly accepted all this as if it were nectar. He did not hold any grudges and ate all this very gladly. <clears throat> At this time, being desirous of obtaining a son, a leader of Dakotas, who came from Indra, wanting to worship the goddess of Bajrakali, while offering her in sacrifice to all man, who was considered no better than an animal. I see a video there. The leader of the Dakotas captured a man animal for sacrifice. But he escaped, and the leader ordered his followers to find him. They ran in different directions and could not find him. Wandering here and there in the middle of the night, covered by dense darkness, they came to a paddock field where they saw the exalted son of the Angriya family, Jadbarita, who was sitting in an elevated place, guarding the field against the attacks of deer and wild pigs. The followers and servants of the Dag the Kaut chief considered Janabarta to possess qualities quite suitable for a man animal, and he decided he was a perfect choice for sacrifice. Their faces bright with happiness, they bound him with ropes and brought him to the temple of Goddess Kali. Hey, Prabhu, can you turn off the video? Is there a video playing? I don't see one. Well, no, no, there was. Um, there was someone over there. Sorry about that. That's okay. After this, all the thieves, according to their imaginative Rituals for killing animalistic men, bade Jadbarta, dressed him in new clothes, decorated him with ornaments befitting an animal, smeared his body with, with scented oils, and decorated him with tilak, sandalwood pulp, and garlands. They fed him sumptuously and then brought him before the goddess Kali, offering her incense, lamps, garlands, parched grain, newly grown twigs, sprouts, fruits, and flowers. Excuse me. This way, they worshipped the deity before killing the man animal. They vibrated <clears> songs <throat> and prayers, played drums and bugles. John Barton was then made to sit down before the deity. At this time, one of the thieves, acting as the chief priest, was ready to offer the blood of John Barton, whom they imagined to be an animal man to the goddess Kali to drink his liquor. He therefore took up the fearsome sword, which is very sharp, concentrated by the mantra of Bajra Kali, raised to kill. John Butterfield. Shall I go on or pass it on? Let's pass it on. We got a few other good readers here. We're going to come back. We got another whole chapter to go. <clears throat> Who wants a little bit of this now? <clears throat> I can read. Okay. Right. Text uh, 17, correct? Yep. All the rogues and thieves who had made arrangements for the worship of Goddess Kali were low-minded and bound to the modes of passion and ignorance. They were overpowered by the desire to become very rich. Therefore, they had the audacity to disobey the injunctions of the Vedas, so much so that they were prepared to kill Jara Bharat, a self-realized soul born in a Brahmin family. Due to their envy, these decoits brought him before the goddess Kali for sacrifice. Such people are always addicted to envious activities, and therefore... <clears throat> They dared to kill, to try to kill Jarabharat. Jarabharat was the best friend of all living entities. He was no one's enemy, 
and he was always absorbed in meditation on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He was born of a good Brahmin father, and killing him was forbidden, even though he might have been an enemy or aggressive person. In any case, there was no reason to kill Jarabharat, and the goddess Kali could not bear this. She could immediately understand that these sinful decoits were about to kill a great devotee of the Lord. Suddenly, the deity's body burst asunder, and the goddess Kali personally emerged from it in a body burning with an intense and intolerable effulgence. Intolerant of the offenses committed, the infuriated goddess Kali flashed her eyes and displayed her fierce, curved teeth. Her reddish eyes glowed, and she displayed her fearsome features. She assumed a frightening body, as if she were prepared to destroy the entire creation. Leaping violently from the altar, she immediately decapitated all the rogues and thieves with the very sword with which they had intended to kill Jadabharat. She then began to drink the hot blood that flowed from the necks of the beheaded rogues and thieves, as if this blood were liquor. Indeed, she drank this intoxicant with her associates, who were witches and female demons. Becoming intoxicated with this flood, they all began to sing very loudly and dance as though prepared to annihilate the entire universe. At the same time, they began to play with the heads of the rogues and thieves, tossing them about as if they were balls. When an envious person commits an offense before a great personality, he is always punished in the way mentioned above. Shukadev Goswami then said to Maharaj Pariksit, O Vishnu Datta, those who already know that the soul is separate from the body, who are liberated from the invincible knot in the heart, who are always engaged in welfare activities for all living entities, and who never contemplate harming anyone, are always protected by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who carries his disc the Sudarshan Chakra, and acts as supreme time to kill the demons and protect his devotees. The devotees always take shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord. Therefore, at all times, even if threatened by decapitation, they remain unagitated. For them, this is not at all wonderful. Very good. Thank you. All right. So maybe I'll read a few because we have a new chapter here. What's this chapter? Chapter 10. Uh, this is the conversation uh, of Jadabharat with Rahugana Maharaj. So I'll read a few, and then if you don't mind, we'll like to pass it around a little bit more. So text one, chapter 10. Sugadev Goswami continued, My dear king, after this, King Rahugana, ruler of the states known as Sindhu and Suvira, was going to Kap uh, Kapila Ashram. When the uh, king's chief palaquin carriers reached the banks of the river Ish Ishkumati, they needed another carrier. Therefore, they began searching for someone. And by chance, they came upon Jadabharat. They considered the fact that Jadabharat was, was very young and had strong and firm limbs. Like cows and asses, he was quite fit to carry loads. Thinking in this way, although the great soul Jadabharat was unfit for such work, they nonetheless unhesitatingly forced him to carry the palaquin. <clears throat> palaquin, however, was very erratically carried by Jadabar due to his sense of nonviolence. As he stepped forward, he checked before him every three feet to see whether he was about to step on ants. Consequently, he could not keep pace with the other carriers. Due to this, the palaquin was shaking, and King Rahugana immediately asked the carriers, why are you carrying the palaquin unevenly? <clears throat> Better carry it properly. When the palaquin carriers heard the threatening words of Maharaj Rihugana, they became very afraid of his punishment and began to speak of him to him as follows. Oh, Lord, please note that we are not at all negligent in discharging our duties. We have been faithfully carrying this palaquin according to your desire. But this man who has been recently engaged to work with us cannot walk very swiftly. Therefore, we're not able to carry the palaquin with him. King Rahugana can understand the speeches given by the carriers who were afraid of being punished. He could also understand that simply due to the fault of one person, the palaquin was not being carried properly. Knowing this perfectly well and hearing their appeal, he became a little angry, although he was very advanced in political science and he was very experienced. His anger arose due to his inborn nature as king. Actually, King Rahugana's mind was covered by the mode of passion. 
and he therefore spoke as follows to Jedabar, whose Brahmin effulgence was not clearly visible, being covered like a fire covered by ashes. King Rahugana told Jedabar, how troublesome this is, my dear brother. You certainly appear very fatigued because you have carried this palanquin alone without assistance for a long time and for a long distance. Besides that, due to your old age, you have become greatly troubled. My dear friend, I see that you are not very firm nor very strong and stout. Aren't your fellows carriers cooperating with you? Thereafter, when the king saw that his palanquin was still being shaken by the carriers, he became very angry and said, you rascal, what are you doing? Are you dead despite the life within your body? Do you not know that I am your master? You are disregarding me and are not carrying out my order. For this disobedience, I shall now punish you, just as Yamaraj, the superintendent of death, punishes sinful people. I shall give you proper treatment so that you will come to your senses and do the correct thing. Thinking himself a king, King Rahugana was in the bodily conception and was influenced by material nature's modes of passion and ignorance. Due to madness, he chastised Jedabarat with uncalled for and contradictory words. Jedabarat was a topmost devotee and the dear abode and uh, the dear abode of the supreme personality of Godhead. Although he considered himself very learned, the king did not know about the position of an advanced devotee situated in devotional service, nor did he know the characteristics of Jedabarat, who was the residence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He always carried the form of the Lord within his heart. He was the dear friend of all living beings, and he did not entertain any bodily conception. He therefore smiled and spoke the following words. Who would like to pick that up? Any volunteers, Nishringa? How about your group? Yes, Bhagavad Pick it up. Chat down will be text nine. Yes, text nine. Chapter 10, text 9. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Yes, Hare Krishna. Yes. Um, text 9. Yes, please. Thank you. The great Brahmana Jada Bharat said, My dear king and hero, Whatever you simply have spoken sarcastically is certainly true. Uh, actually, these are not simply words of chastisement, for the body is the carrier. This load carried by the body does not belong to me, for I am a spiritual soul. There is no contradiction in your statements, because I'm, because I'm different from the body. I'm not the carrier of the palanquin. The body is the carrier. Certainly, as you have hinted, I am not labored carrying the palanquin, for I am detached from the body. You have said that I am not stout and strong, and these words these words are befitting a person who does not know the distinction between the body and the soul. The body may be fat or thin, but no learned man would say such things of the spirit soul. As far as the spirit soul is concerned, I am neither fat nor skinny. There, therefore, you are correct. When you say that I'm not very stout, also I'm the object of the uh, object of this journey, and the path leading there were mine. There would be many, there would be many troubles for me, but because they relate not to me, because they relate not to me, but to my body, there is no trouble at all. Text ten, fatness, thinness, bodily, uh, bodily and mental distress, thirst, hunger, fear, di disagreement, desires for material happiness, old age, sleep, attachment for the body, for material possessions, anger, lamentation, illusion, identification of the body with the self are all transformations of the material co covering of the spiritual soul. soul. A person absorbed in the material 
bodily conception is affected by these things. But I am very free from the bodily conceptions. Consequently, I am neither fat nor skinny nor anything else you have mentioned. Excellent. My dear king, you have un unnecessarily accused me for being dead, though a dead though alive. In this, uh, in this regard, I can only say that this is the case everywhere. This is the case everywhere because everything material has its beginning and end. As far as you thinking that you are the king and the master that I are thus trying to order me, this also. In, this is also incorrect because these positions are temporary. Today you are the king, and I am your servant. But tomorrow the position position might may be changed, and you may be my servant, and I am your master. These are temporary circumstances created by your providence, my dear king. If you still think that you are a king and that uh, that I am your servant, you should order me. And, and I should follow your order. I can then say that this is this differentiation, differen different, different, differentiation is temporary and it expands only from usage or co convention. I do not see any other cause. In that co case, who is the master and who is the servant? Everyone is being forced by the laws of material nature. There is no Therefore, no one is master and no one is servant. Nonetheless, if you think uh, that you are the master and I'm your servant, I shall accept this. Please order me. What can I do for you? My dear king, you have said, you rascal, you dull, crazy fellow. I'm going to chastise you and then you will come to your senses. In this regard, let me say, that although I live like a dull, deaf, and dumb man, I am actually a self-realized pers person. What will you gain by punishing me? If your calculation is true and I am a madman, then your punishment will be like a beating a dead horse. Therefore, there will be no effect. When a, when a madman is punished, he is not cured of his madness. Sukadev Goswami said, O Maharaj Parikshet, when King Rahaguna chastised the exalted devotee Jadbharat with harsh words, that peaceful, saintly person tolerated it all and replied properly. Nisance is due to the bodily conception and Jadabharat was not affected by this false conception. Out of his natural humility, he never considered himself a great devotee, and he agreed to suffer the results of his past karma like an ordinary man. He thought that by carrying the palanquin and he was destroying the reactions of his past misdeed. Thinking in this way, he began to carry the palanquin as before. To someone Okay. Okay. Well, who wants to read? We got any volunteers out there? <laughs> you all seem like such nice volunteers. I can <laughs> read. Well, well, there you start. go. There's one I was waiting for. I heard. <laughs> Text 15? Yes, please. Thank you. I may not be as fast as the other guys. I have to be slow in my reading. You take your time. We enjoy I, it. Yeah. Okay. Text 15. Sukhadev Goswami continued. O oh, best of the Pandu dynasty, Maharaj Pariksha, the king of the Sindhu and Su Suvira states, Maharaja Raguna, 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 Raguna had great faith <clears throat> in discussions of the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. Being thus qualified, he heard from Jaj Bhat that philosophical presentation, which is appro approved by all scriptures, on the mystic yoga process and which reckons the knot in the heart. His material conception of himself as a king was thus destroyed. He immediately descended from his, his palanquin and fell flat on the ground with his head at the lotus feet of Jadabharata. In such a way, 
that he might be excused for his insulting words against the great Brahmana. Then he prayed as follows. King Ravuna, Ravuna said, O Brahmana, you appear to be moving in this world very much covered and unknown to others. Who are, who are you? Are you a learned Brahmana and saintly person? Question mark. I see that you, you are wearing a sacred thread. Are you one of those exalted, liberated saints such as Dattatreya, Dattatreya and other highly advanced learned scholars? May I ask whose disciple are you? You are. Where do you live? Why have you come to this place? In your mission, in, is your mission in coming here to do good for us? Please let me know who you are. F17. My dear sir, I am not at all afraid of the thunderbolt of the thunderbolt of King Indra, nor am I afraid of the serpentine piercing trident of Lord Shiva. I do not care about the punishment of Yamaraj, the superintendent of death, nor am I afraid of fire. According to sun, moon, wind, nor, uh, nor the weapons of Kuvira. Yet I am afraid of offending a Brahmana. I am very much afraid of this. Uh, my dear sir, it appears that the influence of your great spiritual knowledge is hidden. Factually, you are the we are bereft of all material association and fully absorbed in the thought of the Supreme. Consequently, you are unlimitedly advanced in spiritual knowledge. Please tell me why you are wandering around like a dullard. Oh, great saintly person, you have spoken words approved by the yogic process, but it is not possible for us to understand what you have said. Therefore, kindly explain it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I consider, can I go ahead? Yes, three little more. I consider your good self the most exalted master of mystic power. You know the spiritual science perfectly well. You are the most exalted of all learned sages and you have descended for the benefit of all human society. You have come to give spiritual knowledge and you are a direct, direct representative of Kapila Dev, the incarnation of God and the plenary portion of knowledge. I am therefore asking you, O oh spiritual master, what is the most, what is the most secure shelter in this world? Is, is it not a fact that your good self is the direct representative of Kapila Dev, the incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Question mark. To, to examine people and see who is actually a human being and who is not, you have presented yourself to be a deaf and dumb person. Are you not moving this way? upon the surface of the earth or surface of the world I am very attached to family life and worldly activities and I am blind to spiritual knowledge nonetheless I am now present before you and I am seeking enlightenment from you how can I advance in spiritual life you have said you have said I am not fatigued from labor Although the soul is different from the body, there is a fatigue. There is fatigue because of bodily labor, and it appears to be the fatigue of the soul. When you are carrying the palanquin, the palanquin, there is certainly labor for the soul. This is 
this is my conjecture conjecture you have also said that the external behavior exhibited between the master and the servant is not factual but although in the phenomenal world it is not factual the products of the phenomenal world can be actually can actually affect things that is visible and experienced as such even though material activities are are impermanent they cannot be said to be untrue Shall I go on or somebody? If there's only one one or two more, so just finish. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, King Rahugana continued, My dear sir, you have said that the relations like bodily fatness and thinness are not characteristics of the soul. That is incorrect because the relations like pain and pleasure are certainly felt by the soul. You may put a pot of milk and rice within fire and the milk and rice are automatically heated one after the other. Similarly, due to the bodily pains and pleasure, the senses, mind and soul are affected. The soul cannot be completely detached from this, this conditioning. My dear sir, you have said that the relationship between the king and the subject or between the master and the servant are not eternal. But although such relationships are temporary, when a person takes, takes the position of a king, his duty is to rule the citizens and punish those who are disobedient to the law. By punishing them, he teaches the citizens to obey the laws of the state. Again, you have said, that punishing a person who is deaf and dumb is like chewing the chewed or grinding the pulp. That is, that is to say, there is no benefit benefit in it. However, if one engages engaged in his own occupational duty as ordered by the supreme lord, this sinful activity, his sinful activities, are certainly diminished. Therefore, if one is engaged in his occupational duty by force. He benefits because he can vanquish all his sinful activities in that way. Uh, whatever you have spoken appears to me to be contradictory. Oh, best friend of the, this distress. I have com committed a great offense by insulting you. I was puffed up with false prestige due to possessing the body of a king. For, for this, I have certainly become an offender. Therefore, I pray that you kindly glance at me with your causeless mercy. mercy. If you do so, I can be relieved, relieved from the sinful activity brought about by insulting you. <coughs> oh, my dear Lord, you are the friend of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Who is, who is the friend of all living entities? You are therefore equal to everyone and you are free from the bodily conception. Although I have committed an offense by insulting you, I know that there is no loss or gain for you due to my insult. You are fixed in your determination, but I have committed an offense because of this, even though I may be as strong as Lord Shiva, I shall be vanquished without delay due to my offense and the lotus at, at the lotus feet of a Vaishnava. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Very good. Very good. Two nice chapters tonight. So there's got to be some comments or some questions about those two chapters, right? So let's just open it up for discussion. If anybody has any questions or comments or something that they stood out to them that uh, kind of made an impression of these stories? Anybody think of anything you'd like to bring to uh, to our attention? Okay. 
All right. So if that's the case, then what we'll do is just kind of recap a little bit of this and go back through these two chapters and bring out, I think, the, the main points of these, these chapters. So we're following along the life of, of uh, King Bharat, right? Bharat Maharaj, who had left as the most, ex most successful king. He'd gone uh, to uh, Badr Gashram to meditate, and he had his mind fixed completely in samadhi. Uh, at that time, he was actually performing his, <clears throat> I guess, bath or whatever ablutions in the water. There was a deer that was drinking in the, in the same uh, river. About that time, a tiger roared, and the deer, who was pregnant, immediately jumped and miscarried uh, the baby doe. The doe then uh, uh, was suffering horribly, and uh, so was the deer, and she fell into a cave, and the deer died immediately, it says. So the deer, the baby deer, became kind of the ward of this great king who was in a state of renunciation, who was fully in a state of samadhi, actually. So you can see that these stories are there to show us that no matter, even if you're the king of the world, if you allow yourself to become distracted from your purpose and from your goal, uh, your mind can be carried away like a riven cloud. It says so in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says like that. It, it, the mind of a man of discretion, who is attempting to control his mind through discretion, simply by meditating on one of the senses or the objects of one of the senses, his mind can be completely carried away. So we're on a, Prabhupada says, calls it a razor's edge. And just one little slip on this razor's edge and one can be cut. And so that cutting we see in the life of King Bharata was that he was meditating on the deer at the time of death. Krishna says, whatever you think of at the time of death, this you shall attain to without fail. So he had meditated on a deer and had become obsessed with the deer. And therefore he took the body of a deer. He entered into the womb of a mother deer. And, but because of his pious life and because of all the great service that he had done, he was blessed to not forget his previous life. So he could completely understand that he had to endure this body of a deer. And if you read about what he did in the body of a deer, he did the same thing as he's doing as Jadid Bharat. He stayed away from everybody. He didn't want any influences. He realized his era of becoming distracted. <clears throat> so uh, there's a there's a song that Mirari Ben says, uh, flock of birds flying high, shiny object, caught his eye. So see, that's the thing. If we get a shiny object that catches the eye and we're disturbed by that, then we can fall to a spark of God's splendor. Everything is God's splendor. Everything we see here is created by God. Uh, you know, all the senses are created by God. The body we live in is created by God. The soul is a, is a uh, uh, expansion. The individual Jiva soul is, is an expansion from the body of God. Uh, everything we are, everything we have, everything we see, everything we do is God. We are literally steeped in God, but we've forgotten it. Somehow or another, God is everywhere, but we can't see him because we're in a state of illusion. And the state of illusion is that distraction that takes us away from understanding what is our mission here in this world? What the Tato Brahma Jigasa means. Why am I here? Who put me here? What am I supposed to be doing here? And uh, where can I go when I leave? Now, unfortunately, until about 50 years ago, the ancient Vedic literature uh, was not widely distributed or available to the Western world. And as a result, we had so many um, partial understandings of God, or I would say, grossly misunderstandings of God. And people are walking around. I mean, if you go out on the street today and you ask people, what does God look like? What do you think they might say to you? What do they think God looks like? I mean, I, I think we should do this. 
Maybe, hey, Rakesh, maybe me and you ought to go out on the street in Augusta or something. <laughs> and we'll just walk up to everybody and go, excuse me, sir, but could you tell me what God looks like? Boy, people would freak out, wouldn't they? So, okay. we, huh? That sounds good. <laughs> I'd tell you, it'd be a very interesting discussion, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's kind of like asking you, a lot of people, they say, who is the president of the United States? They don't have a clue. They think it's a... Uh, what's that? What's that uh, lady's name? Uh, what, what's her name? Big O. We call her the Big O. What's what's her name? A black lady. She's very funny. She got her. Miss, own... Miss, 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 Michelle. Not Michelle. Maybe. Not Michelle Obama. But her. Maybe. The, the lady Kamala she likes. Kamala, Kamala Harris. Yeah. Uh, I can't think oh, of her name. Oprah. Oprah. There you go. Oprah. <laughs> you know what my kids used to call her. They called her the okra. <laughs> <laughs> they called her the okra. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, so okra, like, you know, the vegetable. <laughs> She's from Nashville, by the way. Her father used to cut our friend's hair uh, down in Jefferson Street, this part of town. Uh, and so they would they would go to his, his barber shop and uh, that's where she grew up in that neighborhood around the barbershop. It became very potent somehow. She was empowered to affect the lives of a lot of people. But she should have done it and used it, her platform uh, for the glorification of Krishna. But in most cases, when people get a platform, they use it for their own aggrandizement. And she did that. So now she, she has the Oprah channel. <laughs> I have no idea what she's talking about on there, but it's probably all nonsense so um anyway so so the idea was is he did not forget his situation he was blessed to to not be able to forget and therefore what did he do he he did everything with his in his power to become completely un, uninvolved uh he didn't want to be involved in any possible way in the material world. And in order to avoid the influence of society, he remained like a deaf uh, and a dumb person. Even with his father, he couldn't train him up. Tried to train him up how to even wash his hands. He couldn't do that. His brothers saw him as an opportunity to exploit for profiteering because Jedabard had no needs. He, he had no interest in the material world. Whatever they would give him for food, he would eat. Worm eaten grains, the burnt uh, rice that stuck to the bottom of the pot, they would give him that. And he would gladly accept it and never protest. So in the life of Jedabarad, they so many things happened to him. Even when the when they, they came to get him to, for the offering, uh, uh, you know, as a man uh, animal, to God's calling, he didn't protest. He didn't protest. You know, when I think about the life of somebody else that didn't protest, it reminds me of the life of Lord Jesus Christ. Because when they brought him before, I guess, Pontius Pilate, um, and they asked him, you know, would he like to defend himself? He didn't, he didn't speak up on his behalf at all. So he believed that God would take take care of that that if he takes care of it then what has god got to do so he wants to put himself under the shelter of the lord so in this situation jetta bard had had a very similar uh uh appearance you know he he was uncaring about his external situation he didn't want to mix with anyone who was not a devotee at all so, and of course, uh, this process really should be adopted by, by everybody. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, a sat sangha chaga, a Vaishnava achara. And what that means is, is that no matter what, you should strictly avoid the company of non devotees. Because by the company of non devotees, even though they're family members, they could be your own family members. And a uh, thought comes to mind about what Christ said uh, when they asked him <clears throat> to bring, if he came to bring peace, he said, no, I came to bring a sword to uh, create division 
even amongst brother and brother. And what is that based on? That's based on the truth. So if, if, if somebody is not willing to accept the truth, we have to still stand on the truth. We don't give up the truth and sway in their direction. We stand solid with the truth, and then the, hopefully they will follow the example. Uh, if they are foolish men, however, they normally do not follow the example, and they don't learn from example. As a matter of fact, they don't learn even after they've made the mistakes and have been punished. So they have to repeat the punishment again and again and again and again and again and again. And that's why we're here taking these repeated births and deaths literally millions and billions of times. We're taking all these different bodies, 8,400,000 species, thinking that, you know, maybe in the next species, I'll actually be happy. Maybe if I just had this wife, I would be happy. Maybe if I had these children, I'd be happy. Maybe if I had this much more money in my bank account, I would finally be happy. Or maybe if I had had sovereignty over my own nation and I could control people as my minions, maybe then that, I would be happy. But none of these things have brought happiness to not one single soul. Not one. We have to admit, we are not God, even though we're envious of God, and we want to have the power of God, the beauty of God, the fame of God, the fortune of God. We want to do all the things that God can do, but we're unwilling to pay the price. We're unwilling to actually live the life and walk the walk, become godly people by following the footsteps of these great souls like Jadabar. Okay? And by doing that, we actually can attain saintly qualities. So association is like a crystal ball. You know, there's these people that look into the ball and they predict your future. Well, it's a reflection of yourself. You look in there and there's a reflection of who you are. So what you, what you associate with, you will reflect in your life. It's impossible not to. You're like a mirror. Whatever you associate with, your, that reflection is shown through you as well. So uh, we see that it's easy for impressionable young people if they don't have money, if they don't have family, if they don't have good mentors, uh, they become victims of the penal system and they become repeat offenders in that environment. So as we were reading through in chapter 10 a minute ago, it said when a madman is punished, he is not cured of his madness. Did anybody catch that as we were reading through this a minute ago? <laughs> I just st stuck out to me like a like glaring light, you know, because I've worked in the prisons uh, for since 1982. Rupanuga put me in the federal penitentiary to preach down there. And we've been going back and forth to these prisons ever since. Here lately, we've not been able to get in since COVID. They've changed a lot of the rules, but we used to go there and do kirtan and classes on the Bhagavad Gita and uh, we smuggled in Gitas and uh, so forth and so on, whatever we had to do uh, to try to affect these people in a positive way. Unfortunately, <clears throat> most people who get out of jail are not reformed. It's not a reformation type system that they're offering. It's a punishment system. So there's no retraining of the mind and the heart. They're just idle and the idle minds, the devil's workshop. So we try to bring as much Krishna into the jail as we can. Um, and the example, they were all in jail. I mean, we think we have freedom because we're on the outside. When I used to live, leave those prisons and those concrete block walls and hear those metal cages slamming shut and realize those guys had no freedom. They weren't going anywhere. They weren't leaving the building. They weren't leaving the yard. It was surrounded by barbed wire. And I thought, how unfortunate. But then I compared it to my own situation. And I realized that I'm entrapped in a body that I can't get out of. I mean, did some people try to get out of it by committing suicide or whatever. They can't get away from themselves. <clears throat> There's no way to escape this. This is you. This is your reality. This is who you are. You have a soul. It's eternal. And uh, you have to... Uh, Get it right or just you know, continue with this repetition of madness. 
it's mad for a person to think that they can survive in a world where there are no survivors. Think about this for a second. Most people are unconcerned about their imminent death. They don't care about it. They don't want to hear about it. The funeral homes are so nice and everything's very tidy and very, very nice. And in the back somewhere, they're bringing in the corpses. Yeah, right. They're trying to hide it. And when they come and pick up the corpse, they cover it up so you can't see it, carry it out in a black bag. Everybody is, uh, death is abhorrent. It, nobody wants to die. But it's imminently coming for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if you're young or old or whatever. You know, whatever your next breath is, you know, you're using your breaths until the time is up and Krishna will come. Just like it said earlier that he was unaware, but death didn't forget him. He had forgotten about time passing and about death coming, but death did not forget him. Death remembered him and came for him so when death comes for us we have to have our mind fixed on krishna so what happened here he allowed his mind to stray and krishna says in bhagavad-gita from whatever and wherever the mind run, uh, uh you know is deviated due, due to its restless and fickle nature one must surely bring it back under the control of the self so this is uh the wisdom that we get from bhagavad-gita so yoga means to accept everything favorable for Krishna consciousness and reject everything unfavorable. That's the first two principles, even in Ashtanga, yama niyama. You got to give up that stuff that's not helping you. And you got to hold on to the stuff that's bringing you closer to Krishna. So in this case, Jetta Bard had it given us an example of a person who had completely renounced the material world and was living in that way now this is in a previous time previous era and uh there are uh yuga dharma that we know about and so he was teaching that yuga dharma as an actual empowered incarnation of god in this way so he was teaching this and he was always in his heart chanting and remembering vasudev the supreme personality of godhead Although he looked like a crazy fellow to all the neighbors. Everybody looked at him as if he was completely dull and just dumb. And uh, But in his heart, he was pure devotee and he had his mind fixed perfectly. So even though they tried to educate him, uh, they tried to get him to take the sacred thread as a Brahmin. Uh, and uh, even his father and mother were frustrated with that and were and he he was just not interested in the reformatory method he was just not interested so um even without undergoing all these official ceremonies um he was completely 100 percent krishna conscious and due to his silence a lot of people thought that he was just no better than an animal. He never stood up for himself. He ate refuse. He didn't clean himself correctly. And so everybody looked upon him as if he was uh, just completely mad, completely crazy. So uh, after, you know, the death of his father and mother, uh, his stepmother and stepbrothers, they started treating him very poorly. And what they did was they uh, started using him uh, for uh gaining money and they would give him the most condemned food um whatever it was he didn't mind he never protested one time he took it very gratefully as if it were nectar it says he received it as if it were nectar because he saw it as coming from the supreme personality who got it you know there's a there's an axiom that says if you don't let people uh disturb you you won't be disturbed. Think about that a minute. If you don't let anything disturb you, you will not be disturbed. So, but if you let somebody anger you, they control you. Now you're a slave to that person. You're a slave to that anger and that karma comes to you and not to them. 
So you've got to uh, somehow or another not be a slave to everyone and give everything you have back to Krishna in your heart and soul. Continue on in the way you're doing with your prescribed duty. And by doing that, you can also be completely Krishna conscious at time of death, even though you're living in the self-same environment that you're currently in. And Jada Bar was showing us how to do that. So uh, interestingly, uh, God is Kali, when they got him and took him to uh, offer his blood and sacrifice to the God is Kali because they were mad after riches and money and power. They thought that if they, if they could appease the God is Kali with the blood of this Dakoit that they would be, then satisfy her and be able to get the riches and the money and the wealth and the things that they were after, which were all material. So Goddess Kali, she recognized Jada Bharat as the true saint he was. Uh, and it, it angered her because when she saw that they were about to put a knife to him, she, it literally, she literally burst out of her deity form and began this dance of killing just wholesale killing of these dacoits, these rascals who had taken this holy man and were going to sacrifice him for their own selfish purposes. So she began, they, all, all of her and her demons, says they all grabbed and chopped the heads off. They're drinking the blood. They're throwing the heads around like a ball game. They're laughing hysterically. You know, uh, the image of Kali is, is that of the most beautiful Maya is the most beautiful, attractive thing for him. You want it so bad you can't stand it. And then when you embrace that beautiful form and you look up, there is this hideous reality of death and destruction and uh, literally being devoured by this material energy. We, you know, when, when Arjuna saw Krishna's universal form, he saw hundreds and thousands of mouths, gaping mouths with teeth, teeth gnashing. And all souls were running headlong into these mouths and their heads and their skulls were being crushed in the mouths of this, these all devouring mouths. This Maya consumes itself and regenerates itself. It's a perfect whole. You read Sri Sopanishad in the first verse in Sri Sopanishad, it talks about how it's completely whole. Everything is completely whole. It regenerates itself. Krishna sets it in motion. He's not worried about it. It's going on under his control, uh, but he's not directly involved. He's got demigods. He's got Krishna never goes anywhere by himself. When he goes, there's demigods accompanying. There's entourage. All of his favorite friends are there with him. They all take incarnations um, uh, together so that they can be with Krishna and enjoy these pastimes with the Lord and enhance their devotion. So uh, these uh, dacoits that were going to uh, do this had misbehaved towards a devotee and they were punished by the arrangement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in this way. And it says that's typical for people who are uh, engaged in these sinful types of activities. So, uh, okay. So uh, the first thing Jadabar had told to King uh, Rahugana was that after he chastised him, obviously, called him a rascal, uh, he was trying to save the ants, sweeping the ants out of the way, and he just couldn't carry the thing, and it, it happened again. And so finally he wanted to know what was going on, and Jadabar then began instructing the king. And the first thing that he said is that you're not your body. And that's really the first thing Prabhupada told us, was that you're not your body. Everything you think that you own, everything you think that you are in this material world, everything that you, you, you consider your expanded family and so forth and so on, <clears throat> is an illusion. Now it's real, and, and later Rahugane goes back through it all and quantifies what Bart was, uh, Jetta Bart was saying to him. And you'll see those questions at the end of, I believe it's the next chapter, where he, he tells him, he said, you've said all these things, but I think, I think it is a king, king's duty to chastise. I think that's my uh, occupational duty. So he was a bit confused. 
he felt like what Jedebard had told him was conflicting because he said, you're not a king. You're not this body. You're not this right now. You think that you're the master and I'm the servant, but it's temporary. Later, I might be the master and you might be the servant, right? So, but that doesn't mean that we neglect our duties, just like Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. He didn't want to go kill all these people. They were all his family members, right? His teachers, the people he respected and adored and admired and loved, even though they were on the crew of his side, the wrong side of history. Arjuna felt compassion in his heart because he's a great devotee, right? So, so the idea is that even in that situation, we have to understand that he had to carry out his duty. He couldn't just renounce his duty. So the king was making this argument as well. So we're going to get to that in the next chapter because there's going to be some really good, uh, uh, really good teaching in the next chapter by Jadabharat. And but in this particular chapter, uh, the, he also says uh, that uh, the uh, that the king uh, was not he didn't understand his true nature as spirit soul. So therefore, by identifying with the body, he was engaged in all these types of activities, and Jedabar brought him out of that illusion. And the king was changed so much so that later he got down from his palaquin and offered prostrated obeisances to Jadabharat and asked for his forgiveness as he had offended this great soul. But he had excellent questions for him as well. So uh, there's so much instruction here that we could go through. I mean, each one of these things, I mean, each one of these verses is just pregnant with <clears throat> so much information for us to understand the life of Jadabhart and what he was trying to teach us. And basically the same thing that Krishna is trying to teach us that uh, in uh, chapter two, you know, text 14, where he says, Matrisparsa <clears throat> Sitosna Sugadugada, so these things are not permanent. Their happiness that comes with it, the distress that comes with these, th these, these things. It's just like the appearance and disappearance of the winter and summer seasons. They come and they go. All this life that's surrounding you, <clears throat> that we're so attached to, that we think is ours, this body that we decorate, that we care about, of course we should. We should preserve all these things because Krishna has given these to us and we should be good stewards. But we shouldn't become enamored with these things. We should not become enamored by doing that because all of these things are simply arising from sense perception and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. So it's very, very clear. Um that we are immortal spiritual souls and that we should act in the realization and the consciousness of our true selves and not of this false identification of I and mine in this material world, which keeps us in this wheel of samsara rotating in a state of perpetual birth, death, old age, and disease, which no one likes. You know, I was just reading in the last Ekadasi Vrata, where Krishna is talking to Yudhisthira in one of the Puranas. And he describes, he said, these Ekadasis are very dear to me. If a person will simply fast on this day, they can remove as much sin as Mount Meru from their life. They can liberate a hundred generations of family members in either direction simply by conducting a fast. <clears throat> Why? Why is it so easy for us to be able to be absolved? Because Krishna is so compassionate and he wants us to be absolved of all these um, ramifications of our ill activities, of our uninformed activities or of our independent or even rebellious activities. Krishna wants us to be freed of mountains of sin and come back home and be with him. So he gives us all of these opportunities, uh, nine processes of uh 
you know, uh, remembering Krishna, praying to Krishna, chanting Krishna's holy name, worshiping the deity, taking a prasad, all of this stuff, serving the Vaishnava, all of these things are there for us to be able uh, to be mindful of Krishna every day so that when the time of death comes, we don't forget. We don't let our mind run to our family or run to our bank account or run to you know, our home that we're going to lose this house that we've spent everything and time and energy for. We don't want to think about that. We want to give all of that back to Krishna. And if you read the story of uh, Bhishma, who's laying on the bed of arrows, then you'll see how we should actually go about passing from this body. And that is by meditating and letting our mind run to the Lord and take shelter in the Lord. He says, do not fear, I will protect you. Krishna says this in Bhagavad Gita. So, guys, I mean, honestly, we haven't scratched these two chapters. I mean, I got some notes here that we could go, but it's already 815. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep you. Um, but in the next two chapters that are coming up, we'll be able to hear what uh Jadabartha's really got to to say because he's getting ready to start on his instruction uh in a major way so please be here next week for that and we appreciate all the good readers tonight you guys are great thank you so much and for for being here and we just love you and we appreciate you can't thank you enough is there uh is there any other questions or comments and if not we're going to go ahead and end the class tonight all right thank you again guys and next week same time same transcendental station be here or be square <laughs> all right krishna haribo i'll see you next week okay.